It's my great pleasure to bring up Patrick Merck. Thanks, Gabe. I appreciate it. Hello. Um, so you might notice I kind of borrowed that title from somebody you may have heard from here at this conference a couple years back. Um, but I think it's appropriate. Um, so a lot of you have probably heard about Bitcoin in the news uh, recently. Um, and there's a couple different trends that you tend to hear about in these stories that uh, reporters tend to pick up on and think are the most interesting aspects of it. I disagree a little bit. We'll get there. Um, the first is the price, right? Everybody talks about the price and the wild roller coaster ride we've been on recently, uh, which usually ends up into a discussion of tulips. Um, and uh, so when you have a virtual currency that rises from about $17 to $20 uh, per Bitcoin in January up to $266 about two weeks ago, and then back down to 50 and then back up to 90 today, um, you kind of notice there's a lot of market volatility. And that's what the stories are about, and that's what people are focused on. Um, and uh, if they're not talking about the price, they're talking about something a little bit darker, right? Uh, illicit transactions and things like that. Uh, and there's, you know, some sites out there that you can buy some stuff with Bitcoins that you probably shouldn't. Um, now, while they're focusing on Bitcoin a lot, uh, they're not talking about this right here. That's really how illicit transactions are done in this world, not with Bitcoin. Uh, so what, what is Bitcoin really, right? Does anybody know what this is from? So a little movie called Alphaville. I watch a lot of weird movies. Sorry. Um, so what is Bitcoin really? Um, first, it's a protocol. It was introduced by Satoshi Nakamoto, who is a he, she, it, they, someone out there, uh, or some people out there. Uh, there's a lot of focus on who this person is and this mystery person, all that. Uh, it's, it's largely irrelevant at this point, uh, and we'll get to why that's true in a little bit. Uh, secondly, it's open source software, right? So there's a uh, core development team that works tirelessly and on a volunteer basis to build the software that runs Bitcoin right now. And most importantly, it's a community of people. And I think people in this room will, will really kind of grasp that concept better than most. Um, so when we talk about what the value of Bitcoin is, the real value isn't, you know, is it is it like gold? Is it this thing or is it that thing? Or it has no inherent value. The real value of Bitcoin is in the community of people who build it, who use it, and support it. Um, and so you can see, here's our nice little leaderboard, right, for the development community. Here's, a, here's the uh, GitHub repo where Bitcoin is. Uh, and here are all the developers who have contributed uh, code and had their commits accepted. Nice little piece of status for people. Um, and so when you look at Bitcoin, when you see the prices rise and fall and all that, that's, you know, a nice indicator of where demand is at for things, but the real indicator is how many transactions are happening. And the transaction curve, as you can see, uh, shows that this is a community that's growing by leaps and bounds. So what makes Bitcoin so special? Like, why is it Bitcoin, not some other currency? Why isn't it Facebook credits or Amazon coins or something like that? So Bitcoin has a few unique characteristics about it that, that make it very interesting. Uh, so the first is that it's private. So a lot of people, when they hear this, they think anonymous. And Bitcoin can be anonymized, but it's not in itself anonymous. So what that means is your financial life on, in, when you're transacting in Bitcoin, uh, it, it's up to you how much you want to share of that. It's distributed. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer network. There is no central bank. There is no person who controls the supply of Bitcoin. They can't make more Bitcoin. They can't decrease the amount of Bitcoin in circulation. Your accounts can't be frozen. You can't have your transactions blocked by anybody. Transactions are irreversible. Uh, so you can think of Bitcoin uh, a little bit like cash in that sense. If you hand a $20 bill to somebody on the street and they walk away, there it is. It's gone. Um, and, uh, and so it's like a bearer instrument a bit. Your ability to spend Bitcoin uh, is yours so long as you possess what's called your private key. It's global. It's truly global. So we're talking about 
totally borderless transactions. Any two people anywhere in the world, the universe, anywhere that are connected by the internet and both have Bitcoin addresses and private key can transact anywhere from a millionth of a penny to a million dollars within 10 minutes with no fees. Bitcoins are scarce. So this is another thing that comes up a lot. Well, how can the economy grow if there are only 21 million Bitcoins? Uh, it's deflationary, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the truth is uh, there's not really going to be a liquidity trap in Bitcoin. So when we look at some numbers here, there's 1.18 trillion US dollars in circulation right now. Uh, those are divisible by two decimal places. So that's a lot. That's 118 trillion spendable units, which are pennies, right? When you look at Bitcoin, there are 11 million in circulation right now. They'll be capped out at 21 million in 2140. But Bitcoins are divisible by eight decimal places. So that's a big number. And I had to count a lot of zeros to figure what that one was. Um, but 1.1 quadrillion spendable units, the smallest possible unit of a Bitcoin, that's Satoshi's. So, um, it would take a lot of quantitative easing for the US dollar to catch up to that many spendable units. So how does Bitcoin work? Um, it's an open transaction network. So what that means is if I am standing on my stage, and I couldn't bring my phone up here, sorry, um, and I have my phone and I initiate a transaction, I'm broadcasting the network, hey, Patrick wants to send uh, Gabe a, a Bitcoin right now. And the network will receive this message, and then the miners, and the miners, and talking about that, I'm happy to do maybe offstage, because it's its own rabbit hole, um, but it's fascinating. Um, the miners will pick up on this, and they will incorporate my transaction into what's called a block. They will mine that block and add it to the blockchain, which is the full public ledger of every transaction that's ever happened in the history of Bitcoin. When the full network and 51% of the miners accept that as being true and accurate as a representation of the public ledger, you know your transaction is complete. So why are we even talking about Bitcoin? What problems does Bitcoin solve, especially for people like you? Microtransactions. So these are really, really big problems that have been around uh, with us since the internet gained popularity in the first place. How do we conduct microtransactions on the internet? Well, with a Bitcoin, you can, again, spend uh, anywhere from a millionth of a penny to a million dollars. The transaction fee is the same. The speed is the same. The friction is the same. Uh, if I wanted to charge somebody uh, their credit card for a dollar, it would cost me about 33% of that dollar in transaction costs. So now we have a currency where you can actually transact in any denomination at any time. So if you have the ability to have that you know, friction-free microtransactions, now we can start talking finally about direct user monetization, which a lot of people have tried and failed to do. Um, but we may have cracked the code here. So think about a currency, right, that uh, you can totally automate the payment flow and the payment process and all the friction points. So say you're going to the New York Times and you're hitting their paywall. Right now you've got to buy a subscription and do this and that or whatever. Well, what if instead you had in your browser just an automated script that says whenever I see an article on the New York Times, it's going to deduct you know, 0.0002 bitcoins. I never see it. I don't have to press a button. It just happens automatically. As long as my wallet and my browser keeps getting seated, then I can keep paying and I can keep looking at as many articles as I like. How I earn those bitcoins, I can buy them, I could mine them, I could earn them from doing tasks across the internet. Uh, there's a million ways where I could get them. So that's never been able to be done before. Uh, and lastly, and probably most importantly for people here, Bitcoin is emerging as the internet's reference currency. Right? This is the currency that all of your virtual currencies can finally be indexed against. So when you're trying to peg a value to what your currency is, you can just look and see, hey, what is a Bitcoin trading at? I can peg, I can, um, I can peg it to that. And potentially, I can let my users trade their points that they're earning on my site I uh, to trade them out for Bitcoins. So uh, I'm assuming that people don't care about your virtual currency this much, um, but they care about Bitcoins a lot. Um, and it floats against a basket of, of currencies globally. 
So whether you're pinning your uh, virtual currency against the yen or the British pound or the euro, what have you, uh, you know, there's a correlation to the Bitcoin there. And, and there's actually a correlation to Bitcoin and other altcoins like Litecoin and Ripple and some of the other cryptographically based currencies that are out there. So is it safe? We get this a lot, right? Because people think, okay, well, you know, we talked about price volatility, <laughs> which is a big problem. Uh, if I'm going to start issuing Bitcoins to all of my users who come to my website or if I'm accepting them as a merchant, well, how do I deal with the fact that the currency just moved $100 of Bitcoin in a matter of a week? And uh, there's no real good answer to that, right? I can't sit here and say, I promise you that the volatility will go away anytime soon, and it probably won't. Um, it's a growing economy, and it's going to have fits and starts. What I can tell you is there are a lot of businesses out there with venture backing who are betting long on Bitcoin and will hedge out all the market risk for you. So if you want to take Bitcoin right now, there are plenty of people who will help you out and take all the risk out of the equation. Hackers, right? That's the other one. Everybody talks about hackers and Bitcoin, right? So let's clear up some misconceptions about uh, hackers and Bitcoins. The Bitcoin protocol itself and the open source software has never been hacked in four years plus of existence. It's based on SHA-256 cryptography, the same stuff that the military uses, your bank uses. If people can crack that, they're going to crack your banks. And they're going to probably crack your banks first because there's more money there. Where there are vulnerabilities, uh, it, they lie either with you not being careful, and that's happened a lot, or trusting somebody who doesn't do a very good job of being careful for you. And that's happened as well. And that's where the hackers exploit Bitcoin. Uh, but they do it in the same way that they exploit other financial institutions as well. So, is it legal? Um, yes, <laughs> is the short answer. And uh, I know that I've heard this a lot. Uh, you know, well, I talked to a lawyer and he told me that Bitcoins are illegal. Well, it's, it's flat wrong and um, I've issued a challenge you know, to any lawyer who thinks that Bitcoins are illegal to come and talk to me and convince me because it won't happen. Uh, they are perfectly legal, and in fact, uh, FinCEN, as the Department of Treasury, uh, recently sort of gave their blessing in a way, right? Oops, I clicked one too far. Um, so, FinCEN's guidance said that, well, if you're taking a decentralized virtual currency like Bitcoin, and you're uh, buying or goods or services with it, or you're accepting it for goods and services, then you're not a money service business, and you're okay. You're free to transact. There's no reporting requirements. You're not going to jail. You know, there's nothing, none of that's going to happen. When you start exchanging Bitcoin for cash, that's when you need to do some reporting. And there's just some regulatory stuff that has to happen. But there are exchanges that exist out there who are willing to put in that work for you so you don't have to worry about it. But as far as accepting Bitcoin for your goods, services, virtual goods, whatever you have for your virtual currency, you're free to do it. The government's blessed it. Okay, so this is the most interesting part for me. What does the future hold for Bitcoin? Um, and there are a lot of answers to that, and we can talk about a lot of different possibilities. Uh, there's clearly a market for uh, international remittance for diaspora populations. We had a great talk earlier uh, talking about uh, the wealth disparity that exists in the world. Um, and I believe that a lot of that is due to having large unbanked populations who don't have access to sophisticated financial uh, services. Bitcoin is its own bank. It's its own payment system on rails. You don't need to interact with existing financial institutions. You don't have to take on banking risk. You don't have to convince your bank manager that what you're doing is okay. It just works. And it works open and distributed and no one can take your money or seize your funds. So for the large, unbanked population of the world, Bitcoin could truly be a revolution. And if you think about it, it's the first time in human history where you have a method of sending money or, or any store of value instantly around the world for almost no fee with no government or financial institution involved and no one being able to seize or freeze or stop the transaction. That's truly revolutionary stuff, right? Um, so 
when we talk about what the future holds, Bitcoin is an open platform. The best way to think about it is like the WWW protocol, email, something like that. So the real value in Bitcoin, it's not the price, it's the people, the people building it, the people in this room, hopefully, who take this and say, that's interesting, I'm gonna build something cool with Bitcoin. That's the real value of Bitcoin, and you know, we will all do well in Bitcoin together if people take this up and they run with it. Uh, and for me, it's just kind of a privilege to sit here and witness this revolution unfolding and to see what people are going to do and build with this amazing thing. I have no idea what the killer apps are gonna be for Bitcoin. I cannot wait to find out. Thank you very much.